Hi, this is a presentation by Rick Davies on content analysis of MSC stories, or most significant change stories. Content analysis is about the coding of stories using different categories to describe them, and in that way to summarize uh, large amounts of text into a smaller set of categories of stories. The analysis, content analysis, is not just about coding those stories, but also analyzing the frequency of different categories and the relationships between those categories in the different stories. Content analysis is a way of summarizing large amounts of text. It's a complementary way to the method used by MSC, which is about summary by selection. Summary by selection is when you, for example, reflect on yesterday's experience and all the things that happened, and come to the conclusion that one particular event that took place yesterday was most significant because of its particular uh, consequences. So summary by selection is one way of summarizing large amounts of experience and in, in the case of written or documented stories, content analysis is another. Content analysis is meant in this case to be a complementary method to the main method used by MSC, not a replacement. It's not a necessary thing that has to be used with MSC, but it's a, a, a method that can be used. So why should we do content analysis of MSC stories? I think there are basically three different reasons for thinking about doing content analysis. One is to monitor who are the storytellers. When we're looking at stories of significant change coming out of a project, uh, it is worthwhile paying attention to who's provided those stories. We want to know where, what type of people or what type of communities or what locations those stories are come from. While we don't expect most significant change stories to be representative of change as a whole, in fact they're quite the opposite, they are intentionally the most significant uh, changes identified by people, while we don't identify those to be representative, it is in our interest to try and ensure that stories come from a, a wide range of, of storytellers because if they're only coming from a small group of people we may be missing out many other stories that are, are equally if not more significant. So monitoring who are the storytellers is one good reason for doing content analysis. A second reason is to try and track specific issues of concern without biasing or restructuring the whole MSC process that's being used. And a particular example here is, uh, that's probably of interest to most people, is to try and find out what kinds of stories are not being selected. Uh, for example, are negative stories uh, not being selected? And are we mainly, as a result of the selection process, hearing about positive stories? That requires some analysis and comparison of the stories being selected and unselected. The third reason is to identify wider trends that may not emerge through the main uh, most significant change structured selection process. There may be many other trends and developments taking place across the wider set of stories that has not pick been picked up. This is about emergent changes and we'll be talking about how that can be done later on in this presentation. So how do we do it? Well. In the rest of this presentation, I've separated uh, the explanations into two sections. One, about how we go about coding the contents of stories, and secondly, how we go about analyzing the coded contents of the story once we've completed that part. When it comes to coding contents of stories, I'm going to be looking at two different methods. One is about how we code sets of stories, where we look at whole groups of stories and try and identify features of their contents. And the second method is looking within individual stories and trying to code elements within those stories. When it comes to the analysis of coded contents, we're going to look at two different approaches. One which I've described as simple searches, where we have a fair idea of what we're looking for, and secondly, complex searches where we've got a less specific idea of what we're looking for and I'll explain a bit more about that distinction later on. Before we talk about uh, how to go about coding stories I thought it might be useful to start off by looking at a data set of coded stories so we know the sort of thing that we hope we can end up with. What you can see here is a set of stories. These are listed row by row 
and there's an identification number for each of those. And then across the top are the are various attributes of these stories, uh, column by column. And you'll notice I made three broad subcategories of attributes to the stories. Some of the categories uh, on the left-hand side are about the storytellers themselves, their age and their gender, and, and whether the story was selected or not. And then there's a middle set of uh, attributes of the story, um, which I various put various uh, labels across here, whether the story is about conflict, gender, livelihood, human rights, whether it happened locally or nationally, whether it was about land or employment. And now on the right hand side, I put another attribute about the outcome of the story. The cell values um, in most of the uh, matrix that you can see here are zeros and ones, and that's basically uh, nominal data indicating whether that attribute of the story was present or absent in that particular story, or whether the story outcome was positive or negative, you know, one or zero. On the left hand side we've got slightly more sophisticated measures, we've got people's real ages, the ages of the storytellers, and we've got um, the values from zero to three describing whether the story was selected at, what, at a, a first, second or third round of selection process, if there were that many. So the first part of the explanation about how to do context analysis is about coding, and in particular about how we can code sets of stories, whole sets of stories. And the method I want to describe here is a method called card or pile sorting. This is a method that's used by ethnographers and anthropologists, and some of you may be familiar with its use uh, as part of a, uh, the PRA portfolio of methods, uh, for example, wealth ranking exercises. And uh, it's important to point out before I go into the details of these methods that it's, it's both the product and the process which is important here. We want to know what the results of these card sorting exercises are, but we also need to know, um, hear people's explanations of what they're doing as they do it. And I'll explain that a bit more. There are th three methods here. The first one is pair comparisons, uh, which is, in a, it's only just a pile sorting method. This is where you take one story and compare it to another and ask yourself, what is the most significant difference between this story and the other one? And why is it significant? Then you might take the same story and compare it to another story and ask what is the most significant difference here and why is, it, why is it significant. Each time you're doing that, you're generating a potential label that would go on top of one of those, uh, at the head of one of those columns in that, in that um, data set that I just showed you. So it's starting to generate a lot of possible uh, attributes, possible attributes that we might think about using and it can feed into the next exercise which is called free sorting. This is where you ask participants, one person or a group of people, to look at a pile of stories and sort them into any number of piles, uh, two or more, uh, with any number of stories in, in, in each of the piles. And then once they've done that, to explain what each group of stories has in common and how they differ from the other stories. Now this can be done by one person on more than one occasion. You can ask them to do it multiple times, or you can have multiple people uh, doing uh, a sort of the same set of cards. Again, the result will be, in those descriptions of those piles of cards, some attribute names which we can put in the data set. But in addition, uh, as well as noting the name of the, of the uh, given to the group of uh, stories in a pile, we also want to note what stories are in that pile and w we will take that information and use that to put the zeros and ones in the matrix that you just saw. So under a given column the, the label will represent the label given to the group and the ones in it will say which stories were in that group. And if the same person does that exercise a number of times because there's more than one way of sorting stories uh, that uh, what we will end up with is multiple columns uh, in the data set uh, with multiple sets of data and it might be that a given story uh, um, is seen to be part of, of multiple different groups. That's not a problem. 
Uh, the third method that I want to describe is hierarchical card sorting and this is uh, different from free sorting because it's more constrained. In this case we present participants with a set of stories, one per card, and we ask them to sort the stories into two piles uh, of any size uh, according uh, and, and to sort it into two piles according to what they think is the most significant difference between all the stories in those two piles. And once they've done that, they tell us what the difference is, and we use that as a label for the matrix that we've already seen. And we make note of what stories are in each of the two piles, and we put those values in the cells in the matrix. Now, having done that, we've then got two piles of cards. We then take one of those piles and repeat the question. We ask the participant to sort that pile of cards into two more small, uh, two smaller subgroups of cards. And when they've done that, we ask them to tell us what is unique about each group, why it's important. We note that and create a new label for a new column. And again, we note what cards are in each of those groups and use that to put the cell values in the matrix. And we keep doing this exercise until either each pile has only got one card in each, in each pile, in the pile, or there may be more than one card in the pile, but the participant can't see any significant difference between them. You might notice that there's quite a lot of similarity here between the questions being posed in hierarchical card sorting and pair comparisons um, between uh, this process and most significant change itself, because we're asking people to make their own judgments about what is the most significant difference, not the most significant change, but here, what is the most significant difference between the stories that have been told? So it's more about static differences rather than changes. This section is going to look at a different approach to coding of story contents where the focus is on the content of individual stories. And I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, an approach used by SenseMaker, which is a, a proprietary uh, process and software package that's used to collect and analyze or make sense of large numbers of micro narratives or stories that, that are largely smaller than the average MSC story. Um, I'm not going to be talking at length about the alternative, which is the use of packages like Envivo or Atlas, which are software packages that aid researchers to code large amounts of text and then analyze relationships between those codes. I'm not going to be focusing on those methods because the focus in this presentation is largely on participatory methods. That said, uh, the use of Envivo and Atlas by external researchers can still be a very useful way of making sense of large amounts of text. Self-signification is what happens when a storyteller labels or classifies their own story, story rather than some external party, uh, other stakeholders or researchers. The point about signi the signifiers have um, uh, before I just explain the pros and cons of signifiers, I should point out that with SenseMaker, uh, the storytellers use these signifiers to describe their stories, but the signifiers that they can use are from amongst a set provided by the facilitators of the whole process, not by themselves. And so each storyteller can choose from a set of signifiers when they're describing their own story. The value of using self-signifiers is that when someone uh, uses them to describe their own story, uh, uh, that seems to make a lot of sense because the person who's doing that knows the meaning of their story, uh, whereas an external reader of that story may not fully understand what was going on in the story. However, the risk of self-signifiers is that each person, is uh, each storyteller who's applying those signifiers to their st own story may be interpreting the meaning of the signifier in a different way to other storytellers. Whereas if you have one external party, say a researcher apl applying some category to a story, they will be consciously trying to make sure they use the category in the same way in each story. There are basically three types of uh, self-signifiers, and I'm going to explain each of these. And as I do, I'd like you to give some thought to what you think are some of the strengths and weaknesses of each of these methods as we look at them. Uh, 
The first method is called triads, the second is polarities, and the third are category lists. In fact, I'll start off looking at the category lists and we'll work uh, then to the polarities, then to, to the triads. So here on this slide, you can see uh, some multi-choice questions whereby someone who using this interface has already uh, told or uh, a, a, a short story about what has happened and then they're asked to tell uh, to say something about the story that they've given and they're asked to make a choice amongst these categories on the left hand side there are 12 different categories they're asked to choose up to three of these according to whichever ones they think apply to their story. Uh, questions that might be useful to ask in regard to the stories that you're looking at today would be, you know, would any of these categories apply to the stories that you're looking at? Or if not, what alternative categories could you think might be more useful? Secondly, would you think it would be useful to limit the choice uh, to three categories or to any number of categories, uh, any other number of categories, or not to limit the, the choice of categories at all? What would be the pros and cons of doing that? And w uh, what do you think of the merits of this, uh, this approach, this self-categorizing um, approach overall? And can you anticipate any problems that you might have either developing this list as a facilitator or using it if you're a storyteller. You'll notice in the rest of the uh, present as uh, the view here we can see some other category options but uh, and unless we were using the interface uh, and clicking on on these we wouldn't be able to see what those other options are that they because there's a drop down menu there. So that in itself may have you know, its pros and cons. You may be able to fit more into the interface but it's less immediately obvious what the choices are. On this slide, we can see the second type of self-signifier. Uh, in this, this is uh, a polarity, and again, the storyteller is being asked to describe their story, and they're being asked to use it by moving this dot in the center to the right or left along a, a scale, and that scale is a polarity. At one end, uh, it will it will say that the story that they're looking at is about a community effort that failed and at the other end it's about one that succeeded. Uh, the next scale is about um, again about a range of possibilities between whether the event would have happened anyway without an organized uh, community effort or whether it would have been impossible without an organization's help. So again the question is uh, how useful is this way of uh, describing stories? Is it more useful than using categories? Um, does it present any particular problems? And can you think of some other types of polarities that might be useful for the stories that you might be looking at? Here is the third type of self-signifier that's used by the SenseMaker package. This one is called triads for reasons that you can probably see that instead of offering a, a, a polar scale or just a set of categories, people are asked to describe the story uh, um, by moving that dot in the center around within the triangle to a position whereby where it represents the best mix of three different possibilities, three possible descriptions. For example, community, um, the, the community attitu attitudes about the effort in the story are divided, united or indifferent. So um, the participant needs to find a mixture of those uh, three elements that best fit the story and they'll move the cursor around such that it represents that best fit. So they might move it up towards the top if, if the story was really describing divided community F attitudes or they might move it um, just to the left where it was a mixture of both divided and united. There were sort of some people who were in agreement and, and a small fraction who were um, not in agreement. Likewise on the right hand side we can see another triad about um, how a community effort could be improved um, and there are three options here by changing the people involved, the location or the plan and again the participant can move the, the, the dot around in the, tri in the triangle to find a description that best fits their story.
So again, some thoughts for you to think about. Uh, can you think of some other, w would these triads uh, be useful with the stories that you come across? Or can you think of some other triads, some other combinations of possibilities that would be better to use? And what do you think are the pros and cons of using this particular type of self-signifier compared to the polarities or to the categories that we've seen already? We've now come to the second part of the presentation, and this is about the analysis of the coded contents. So we've already got, uh, we've now got our matrix with uh, all those stories coded according to different attributes and the cell values in, the, in that matrix. And the first option is to do some simple searches. And I, I describe simple searches as those ones which we've got a fair idea of what we're looking for. It's a bit like hypothesis testing. We've got an idea and we want to see whether it's true or not. So we know what fields uh, in the data set that we're going to be looking at and we're, going to f and we're going to see what the results are. And there are two types of searches that I've described here, uh, both of which I think you'll be very familiar with. The first is frequency distributions of the incidence of particular attributes in the story. For example, uh, we might want to know uh, about who are the storytellers. Are they mainly men or are they mainly women? We may have a suspicion that men are the main storytellers, but we want to just clarify that because we've got a lot of stories and we need to actually get a frequency count rather than just a gut feeling. Uh, the second possibility is that may, we may want to do some cross tabulations to see the relationship between the different attributes of the stories. So we know the stories have, uh, in the data set, some have been selected um, uh, at, uh, by a group of stakeholders, others haven't. And we, we may want to find out well what kinds of stories have been selected and not selected. Uh, as I mentioned before, we may want to look at the attribute of whether the story had a positive or negative outcome and cross-tabulate that against whether the story had been selected or not or at what level it had been selected. And again, we might have a prior hypothesis that uh, positive stories will be selected more often than negative stories. And here again, just to remind you, is that uh, data set that we're looking at uh, as a result of all our coding efforts. We've got all the stories, the attributes of the stories, including the who told the story, the nature of the story itself, and the outcome of the story. I just mentioned about doing frequency distributions to find out about who were the storytellers. And of course, if we do that and we find that the uh, average age of the storytellers was quite uh, old, um, that in itself um, is not sufficient um, information. We need to also look outside the data set and, for, for example, get an idea of, well, in the same community, um, um, what was the average age in the community. In other words, we, we need to be able to compare the storytellers against the non-storytellers. And the non-storytellers, the easiest way of finding those is just looking at the at the average or the age distribution of the population as a whole, even though that will include storytellers. Um, so we need to look inside the data set and outside the data set. With cross-tabulation, we can just look at inside the data set. Anyhow, let's move on now and look at how we do more complex searches. We're now at the stage of looking at complex searches. Complex searches are where there is a lot of more uncertainty about what we could find, but we've got an interest at this stage of finding out uh, some unexpected but perhaps useful things that we, we, we could know. Uh, it's not a total gamble. We do have some idea of the kind of structure that we're looking for, and the two kinds of structure that we're looking for I'll explain here. The first is we're looking for clusters. So clusters uh, are, can be of two kinds, clusters of stories which all have the same attributes. And we can also be looking for clusters of attributes that are f uh, seem to be found in, in numerous stories. That's the first cluster we're looking at or could be looking for. And the second are associations or what I will call configurations for reasons which I could explain later. Uh, associations are sets of attributes associated with a given type of outcome. For example, a positive story outcome or a negative story outcome. And you will remember in that uh, data set uh, 
that one of the columns was specifically dedicated to describing the type of outcome because I had anticipated that we'll be looking for associations as well as clusters. So they're the two types of things we're looking for when we're doing complex searches. The processes or the, the methods that we use to do complex searches uh, are quite different and they're different for a reason largely to do with scale. That when we get large numbers of stories and particular, particularly when we all, uh, get them associated with large numbers of uh, story attributes, the number of possible types of stories grows exponentially. So the, 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 comp the complexity of the, of the range of things that we could look at becomes enormous and it, it's, a, it's literally an exponential growth. So in this graph here I've showed that with five different attributes there could be 32 different kinds of stories. With 10 different attributes there could be over a thousand. With 15 we're up to 32,000 and with 20 we're up to over a million. So um, while we can use card sorting methods to find clusters of stories uh, with small numbers of cases, uh, to find clusters of stories when we're dealing with large numbers of stories with many different attributes it is beyond the possibilities of participatory methods and that's where we need to look at these other methods of, of analyzing stories. So the methods that we use to do complex searches in with large numbers of stories with many different attributes are, are basically computerized methods or algorithms, uh, systematic procedures that are carried out uh, very dumbly by very quick and um, computers. And there are two types of um, uh, software packages that I'll be talking about. The first is to do with finding clusters and these are basically network analysis tools and the one that I've used and one which is widely available and widely used is a package of two called Usenet and Netral and you can find out more about these by doing a Google search for the name on the internet. And the, the second uh, software packages uh, sec software package I'm looking at is used to find configurations, that is, set of attributes associated with a particular kind of outcome. And these are called data mining tools, and the one I've used here is RapidMiner. Um, I've got a reference at the end of the slide set to a, another method which has actually uh, got a, a, a much more gentle learning curve. The thing to note here is that both of these uh, sets of software can use the data set, the kind of data set that you've already seen but the configuration analysis requires that out, that last column the uh, a clearly specified outcome on the right hand side in this uh, is a network diagram and it was produced by Usenet and Netdraw using the random data set that you've already seen and the blue squares here are stories and the links between them are, are uh, are indicating that the stories are connected by having common uh, set of attributes. Because all the stories in the data set have at least one attribute in common with another story, uh, if we just visualize that directly, what we'd see would be a large, very complex network, which wouldn't be of immediate help to us. Because we're trying to find clusters of stories we, within the large set that might have something in common that other groups of stories don't. And it's a bit, it is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the same task that we're trying to do when we're doing pile sorting with smaller numbers of stories. So what we do in this situation is we try and focus on the stories that are linked by an above average number of shared attributes. And that's what I've done here. And what you can do, that's the virtue of being able to use this software, is it will automatically filter out or filter in uh, the kinds of stories that you're looking for. Here, I filtered out all the connections between stories which are quite weak. In other words, there's only a few shared attributes. And I've focused on the stories which are connected by six or more attributes, an above average number. The point I should make here, a caveat, is that while, for example, number one and 18 are linked by six and more or attributes, they may not be exactly the same attributes as those linked by 18 and 13. They may be slightly different. That's just a point to note. Now, where do we go with this? What this does is help 
a point to an area in the haze, haystack where I find my find a available needle. In other words, if I was to look at a, a clique or a triad of, of stories here, for example, 7, 14 and 19, uh, they, they all show um, an, a, a, a com, um, many shared attributes. So the next step for me would be to go back to the stories, to pick out these stories and see whether in the stories themselves there were substantial similarities in the content of those stories. I'd explore each of these uh, groups of three connected stories. If there were four stories all uh, connected to each other by uh, many uh, shared attributes, I'd then start looking at those. Now here's an example of a similar analysis, but using a real data set, this time a set of 195 uh, stories or micro-narratives produced uh, as part of a sense-maker exercise in Kenya some time ago. And in this case, the participants uh, using that um, interface that you saw earlier were limited to choosing three categories out of 12. So when it came to filtering stories to find clusters, I focused on stories that had at least three common categories uh, with other stories. And here we, and this is the result that we find that amongst the 195 stories, I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clusters of stories um, uh, of uh, with four or more stories, all all completely connected to each other by their common attributes. So this is where I would. Uh, then focus in on those clusters and have a look at the, the underlying stories and see whether there was substantial um, common content in those stories and try and find out what was going there, going on there. I mentioned earlier that there were two types of clusters, clusters of stories but also clusters of attributes. And this, is, uh, this network diagram shows the second type of cluster. These are attributes, uh, as shown by the blue squares, linked to each other by the fact that there are many stories that uh, uh, contain both attributes. So there are many stories that contain references to both livelihoods and rights in the random data set. Uh, and in this case, I've filtered, um, I've used, I've set up the filter quite high so that uh, I found the, the clusters here which had the maximum possible number of shared stories. So here the livelihoods and rights attributes were found in nine of the 20 stories. Likewise the story outcome, positive, and employment and conflict were found in nine, nine stories. And again we have the same caveat as before that the connections between employment and conflict uh, the nine stories there may not be c c exactly the same nine stories as those connecting the story outcome and the employment. And again, I would go back, I'd look at the nine stories connecting, say, livelihoods and rights, and to try and find out whether there is a consistent theme there about these two issues. And I'd, I'd be asking myself, well, is this different to what we've already explored with the more directed search? Had we already done tried to cross-tabulate rights against in, in a livelihood, and what did we find? Or had we not even thought of that? And in, in this case, has this cluster that we've found here highlighted a relationship that we hadn't heard of or thought of before, but is common in the stories? In a sense, that's where we identify the value of this more complex search is whether it's telling us something that we hadn't previously thought was worth looking for. This diagram is about the second type of st uh, structure that I mentioned, uh, associations or configurations. Uh, configurations are sets of attributes associated with a given type of outcome, sets of attributes of a story associated with a given type of outcome. And it's in the struct in the form of what is called a decision tree, and it was produced by a decision tree algorithm in a data mining package known as Rapid Miner. And the story outcomes here are shown as blue for positive and red for negative. You can see them at the at the bottom of each branch. The story attributes are shown in grey labelled boxes. Not all the attributes, but just the ones that have been identified as relevant by, by this package. And the numbers at each of the branch um, 
they tell us uh, the numbers of stories with that set of attributes and outcomes. So if we look down a branch, um, down on the left hand side, there are two stories there with a positive outcome which have all the attributes that are indicated by that branch. And the zeros and ones on the links mean the attribute is present or absent. So for example, if I read down the branch uh, on the right hand story, we will find that um, there, uh, where, uh, where there was employment uh, in the story, referred to in the story, and uh, where it was a local story, there were five such, uh, there were five stories with those features. Um, or, um, uh, there was, for example, uh, where employment was not mentioned, um, uh, but uh, the story was local, we find that the outcomes in that, in, in, the, uh, in, in those combinations of attributes uh, were all negative outcomes. Or we find that where employment was mentioned, uh, but it wasn't a local story, um, uh, but gender was involved, there was a, a, a negative outcome there. So each branch represents an outcome associated with a particular combination of conditions, both their presence and absence. This decision tree is a descriptive model which has a reasonably good fit. Uh, in other words, the, the configurations that we're looking at in each branch lead to a clear positive or negative outcome. But there's one exception where we look down one branch where employment is present, it's not a local story, um, and there are no gender issues there. And the outcome we see there is quite mixed. There are four positive outcomes and three negative outcomes. So what can we do about that in terms of improving this model? Well, we can go back to the stories and try and find out within that set of seven stories whether there's some other feature of those stories which would enable us to correctly split them into uh, positive and, and negative uh, outcomes. So we have to go back into the stories to find that out. Um, this process is in fact uh, quite similar to what goes on in the hierarchical card sorting. You'll remember, which is quite different, that's been done by a participatory process, not a computer process, but in the hierarchical card sorting you can imagine this structure was could be also developed, that the participants might have split all the stories into those about employment and those not, and then when they thought about where employment was present, they might have decided, well, the most significant difference is where the stories are happening locally and where they're not. Uh, they could have derived a similar sort of structure or, a, or with the same uh, content or, or a similar structure but with different content. Um, but the key thing which we have to add to that hierarchical card sorting process is to get uh, not only to ask them about the most significant difference, but what difference would it make to the kind of story outcome. We would have to ask them, okay, you've said this is the most important difference between employment being present and not. Uh, do you expect that to make a difference, a positive or negative difference to the outcome? If we asked that extra question, we'd be generating, we could generate the same sort of decision tree. Um, decision trees, as we've seen them up to now, are basically classifications of stories according not only to their attributes, but to their outcomes. But we can also um, use decision trees as predictive models about what we might find in the future. For example, we could, uh, after all these stories have been collected and analyzed, a new story collection process could take place, and we could take a story from the new set and walk down the tree and ask ourselves the question, is this story about employment? If it is, um, is it about local events? Um, if, it, if it is, uh, then we then ask, well, was there a positive or negative outcome? And if the po outcome was positive, then the decision tree has been, has been a correct predictive model of, of what happens in, in these type kinds of stories. If it was negative, uh, this decision tree is, has not been an accurate predictor, and we would have to look at the difference between that story and the one in the previous set, the five in the previous set, and try and identify the key difference that made affected the outcome, and we might then introduce that as a next step in this decision tree to improve its predictive accuracy. Predictive models 
are uh, about uh, the events in stories are about trying to generalize from the experience that we've seen in the set of stories already analyzed to future stories that might be yet to happen and that surely could be useful information for organizations development organizations collecting stories like this what I've talked about so far is very much about methods, uh, methods suitable for different circumstances, different numbers of cases, different numbers of attributes, and depending on whether you've got a, f a fair idea of what you're looking for versus only a broad idea. Uh, it, the, while there's been one or two real, ex one real example there, I've largely worked with a, a random uh, data set just for illustrations point of view. What I'm looking for is opportunities to test these methods with, with real sets of stories in settings where the results might be useful. So basically this is where I'm ending up with an offer to provide help at no cost uh, with the use of any of these methods for any of the participants in this workshop who want to do content analysis with sets of MSC stories. There's only one proviso and that is that if, if we do work together on this that you would be willing to share some of the results with interested others, uh, you know, for example, via the MNE News uh, website that I run. Thank you very much.